Abbiamo ovviamente... So many different topics, current topics, that we'll be talking through today. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, one of the most important ones uh, is the autonomy, is the strategic autonomy when it comes uh, to becoming digital dominant in Europe. So to understand more about it and understand the state of the art, I'd love to leave the floor to Gerard Pogorel, Director of Economics uh, at the uh, Higher uh, Spirit School in Paris, Telecom Paris. Welcome. So, so, so molto contento di essere. I am so very happy of being here, and I'd love to thank President Alessandro Talotta, with uh, whom uh, we have been in contact for over 12 years, uh, 12 years of efforts uh, and uh, working in common. Uh, and I'm so very honored today that I can be with you and the huge virtual hug from my side. Actually, what I'd love to do is to actually anticipate the topics from, from a, a political area Europe-wide, which is the strategic autonomy in digital. I'm saying anticipating, as there are going to be a summit soon around this very topic, uh, Europe-wide. This is going to be take this is going to take place February 8, 9, to be confirmed. And actually, the presidency, which is going to be a French presidency, uh, so the presidency means uh, on in this very moment uh, means uh, to define the most accurately as possible what are the needs for a strategic autonomy to take place in Europe. Uh, not just in uh, Europe uh, as a geography, but also uh, the strategic autonomy for each and every country, uh, Italy included, but also companies. So let's say that the bottom line is to define a framework for actions, for behaviors that company will have, a company will, will, let's say, adopt. And this is so very important to do it uh, now as we speak. And I'll try to be very accurate in my explanation. So what is the objective here again? So we're talking through autonomy as well as sovereignty. Well, traditionally, these two topics uh, have been associated to defense and industry. Although we're not going to be tackling defense today, but we're going to be talking around the uh, what these concerns uh, really mean for the overall industry. There have been three key factors that that have allowed us uh, to give more emphasis uh, to sovereignty over the last few months and years, indeed. Well, the first one, of course, uh, is the Trump presidency in the United States, which has uh, strengthened uh, some of the already existing topics uh, existing in the United States American politics. Uh, and I'm speaking through uh, America First approach, which is something that we're very much familiar with. And that, uh, well, they have been actually there well before Trump. So they were there already. As you, if you happen to read through the internal documents uh, of Department of State in the, in, in the US, uh, well, it kind of goes without saying uh, it kind of goes without saying uh, that the principle uh, for the America is not free trade only, but it is actually the interest that uh, U.S. has uh, towards, uh, uh, towards American workers. This is, of course, has been further emphasized uh, and, uh, and actually has become evident through Trump first and foremost. Now, if anything is going to change with Biden, well, we don't know. We don't know, actually. I was, I was reading a couple of days ago that Biden politics is very similar 
to Trump's, but perhaps a little bit more polite, if you will. So this need we currently have in Europe of positioning ourselves in a kind of a different way with regard to the United States, well, that is a permanent goal that we should keep in mind. Then, of course, the pandemic, COVID crisis, um, that uh, daily puts forward the, the need of monitoring uh, monitoring society and economy at, at the, the best we can, of course, as well as our people, of course. And then over the last few years, I, 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 I have to have to mention uh, the China's rise uh, to, uh, to world power. So China's becoming increasingly stronger, more powerful, and uh, also considering in virtue of their own internal interests. So when it comes, say, to the industry concerns, uh, well, there are two reasons why we should focus on this. Well, we want to have a strategic autonomy with relation to industries as well as geographies. So the very first thing you, we want to do when it comes to when it comes to the industries, well, perhaps the key question here is uh, for people working in digital industry. So how should we behave? What should we do in a worldwide? Uh, in a world in such worldwide industry where there is let's say a small number of companies actually being quite arrogant and uh, of course europe is a uh, is taking on some is undertaken some important initiatives two two days ago or so the first project around digital have, re have been approved uh, by the European Parliament. I won't spend any more words on this, as I know you're all familiar with it. <laughs> and the other key topic for industries is uh, to identify the so-called uh, strategic industries on which we want to have a top-down approach. These are the key topics that we should work on. Two days ago, again, the European Commission is about to submit January 2022 the so-called CHIPS Act with twofold uh, orientation. First one is uh, to promote some additional public <laughs> funding for the R&D as well as for the production of electronic components. This is the first one. And then the second one has to do with the European priorities uh, that should be paid to Europe uh, in the event of a crisis. Uh, well, it kind of goes without saying that, that this is very much matching uh, the European Commission's, uh, uh, let's say, approach. Let's say that uh, to date, uh, the markets uh, have uh, proven they can be open and, uh, and they can really trust what's going on, although this trust has become a kind of moderate, has kind of melted down over the last few months. So what is it? that we can uh, consider and what is the view that we shall adopt uh, if we are taking, if we're wearing the shoes of the companies. Well, perhaps uh, uh, some of you might remember that initiatives being taken by governments uh, to date uh, not necessarily generate uh, a, um, a very good a very good ratio uh, between cost and benefits and of course uh, being an open market uh, that is a very idealistic approach 
Uh, but unfortunately, we cannot just leave on that. Uh, uh, also, because governments not necessarily have embraced this approach. And around this topic, uh, I think that it is important for the industry to really speak up, to speak up loud, to have their voice being heard by government so that so that we can be fully consistent Europe-wide when it comes to reaching out to objectives, to goals, when it comes to investment, public initiatives, and international trade management. Recently, there has been a, a discussion on the use of uh, services of uh, GAFAM in Europe and uh, more I think this is a, a very delicate topic and at times this might lead to some confusion what is uh, what is clear though is that industries and companies uh, in Europe but outside Europe should definitely collaborate more together and I'd love to very much focus on this as there is a kind of a paradox in the European sovereignty nowadays and that is my very personal opinion so European autonomy and sovereignty should actually, should actually be conceived uh, as embracing uh, uh, foreign partners as well. In Europe, we can be strong, we can be powerful, but we still need to rely upon international partners uh, as well for us uh, to reach out uh, to, a, to, a, to a better balance, especially when, uh, when interacting with, with China to cope with the increasing dominancy of China. So as we prepare this, uh, um, this event on, a, on a strategic uh, autonomy in February, not only we'll be speaking through Europe and we'll be tackling European topics, but actually we have asked some of our colleagues from Japan, United States, from Taiwan, and we've asked also some of the speakers from Australia and the UK, we have asked them to say, to tell up front what do they think not only about their own digital autonomy, but what they think about the relationship with Europe, or what's going on in Europe. What is their view about what we're doing? Has the bottom line here is very much to create a consensus amongst the democratic countries. Uh, so that uh, we can keep the conversation open uh, amongst the allied countries. And uh, I'd love to say that MIX perhaps stands out as a great example, as there are not only Italian companies, but European companies, international companies. Uh, and uh, definitely, we more and more realize that uh, we can uh, define uh, in a practical manner what the strategic autonomy is. In materia. As regards the international opening, the main change, I mean, there have been two. One, now we are absolutely aware of the American vision. It's, you know, slightly ambiguous, as we say. Uh, they say America first. All of the Biden's speeches say so. American first, American workers. And with respect to China, Europe finds it difficult to define itself because uh, interests are different. There are hundreds of European uh, businesses uh, German in particular, but not only German, that have uh, paramount interests in China, over half um, 
of uh, the Volkswagen investments are made in China. And so we are having this peculiar situation. Um, it's not the same as during the Cold War, because now we talk about an important power we are faced with and with which we have uh, very many economic relations. So this makes it even more delicate. And a number of years ago, uh, we uh, used to say uh, that change in China was about to occur precisely thanks to this uh, economic development, but this was not the case, unfortunately. So we have to take this into account. So what can we do in Europe? And what type of policy? I mean, there are two options, engage and disconnect. Engage. This means maintaining a certain type of relations with the other countries in the world. And the issue is uh, just how to define the value chains in this context. We need to understand that the value chains have already been deeply restructured following after the 2008 financial crisis. And this was done based upon uh, a calculation of the labor costs, the robots costs, interest rates on investments, as well as uh, the freight cost. Uh, thus, uh, this certainly is going to go on, but we need to be absolutely aware of the fact that uh, the international value chains are here to stay. Um, it's a long-term calculation, and businesses permanently, permanently optimize this calculation. But the idea of closing the borders is an idea that is not realistic, and I'd like to insist on that. Strategic autonomy doesn't mean protectionism. I would even say that it's the opposite. A real strategic autonomy should include our partners and it's going to be stronger this way. So value chains are about to change, but progressively so. And we're not going to see relocations. So a strategy that some would love to promote would be one of disconnect with China. I won't insist on that. I mean, it's slightly realistic. It's hardly realistic. This is going to be my conclusion. As for the strategic autonomy of Europe, well, it's going to be based upon our innovative capacity and skills and competencies. So we have to use the best technologies, the best services we have. But on top of that, we also have to maintain rules. I would say that, you know, there's a lot of discussion on the social role of uh, businesses. Um, the social role of businesses is uh, most especially to respect the rules. And the rules have to be defined democratically by the policymakers. There are requirements of privacy and security, but on the basis of that, 
the industrial sector and countries and businesses must develop infrastructures and services as efficient as possible. So, uh, this is uh, the message. Sovereignty is and will be increasingly uh, defined through engagement between the industry and governments. It's not going to be protectionism or closing. It's going to be a reasonable and democratic opening, rather. Thank you.